international bestsellers Crazy Rich Asians, China Rich Girlfriend, and Rich People Problems. He's also the author of Sex and Vanity, on sale as of yesterday. Kevin will be speaking with J. Courtney Sullivan, the New York Times bestselling author of the novels Commencement, Maine, The Engagements, Saints for All Occasions, and the forthcoming Friends and Strangers, coincidentally on sale from Knopf as of yesterday as well. We'll be dropping a link to purchase these titles from this event's collaborator, Books Are Magic, in the chat. All right, with all of that, I'll now turn things over to books editor for Time Magazine, Lucy Feldman. Thank you, Jillian. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy Nakata Feldman, the books editor for Time Magazine. And I'm very, very excited to be in conversation tonight with Jay Courtney Sullivan and Kevin Kwan. Welcome, both of you guys. Hello, hello. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. Let me just take a quick minute to read these very impressive official bios for everyone. I think we don't want to skip this part. So J. Courtney Sullivan is the New York Times best-selling author of the novels Commencement, Maine, The Engagements, and Saints for All Occasions. Her work has been translated into 17 languages and her writing has appeared in a very long list of outlets, including the New York Times Book Review, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, New York Magazine, Elle, Glamour, Allure, Real Simple, and O. Oh. And Courtney lives in Brooklyn, New York, with her husband and two children. And Kevin Kwan is the author of the international bestsellers Crazy Rich Asians, China Rich Girlfriend, and Rich People Problems. Crazy Rich Asians was a number one New York Times bestseller, a major motion picture, and has been translated into more than 30 languages. Kevin lives in Los Angeles and is trying to eat less pasta. <laughs> How's that going, Kevin? <laughs> Not very well at this time. <laughs> pasta is sort of like my ultimate comfort food, and so I'm eating it like almost every night. <laughs> to be honest. I totally understand. I'd love to actually just start there. How are you guys both doing? What have the past few months looked like for you? And what is it like? How does it feel to be launching your books from home? Courtney, you want to? Oh, um, well, I too have been eating a lot of pasta, actually, Kevin. Um, and pizza, too, really has been big for me. Um, I have... Uh, two kids. My daughter is 20 months old. My son just turned three um, last week. So they're 16 months apart. And, uh, you know, when the second one came along, that seemed like kind of crazy, but we can, we can do it. We can manage. Um, and I wasn't really, you know, factoring in a pandemic. So now we've been like three months just my husband and myself without childcare. And it's really quite enlightening um, just how much work it is to take care of two toddlers. Uh, so that's kind of been life since mid-March. We um, just kind of wake up and do whatever they want us to do until they go to sleep and we sort of pass out as well. And then sometimes I get a little bit of writing done like somewhere between midnight and 2 a.m. Uh, so it hasn't been my most productive time of life. I'll say that. I mean, the, the working parents of the world, I just, I cannot imagine my, my heart and my stress go out to you for, <laughs> for managing both of those jobs at once. It seems like a lot. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, my kids are awesome, and I actually cannot imagine, to be honest, going through the Trump years or the COVID months without them because they're like these little joy infusions and it's lovely, but it just, you wish you could clone yourself. So one of you could be doing the work and one of you could be taking care of the children. I bet, I bet. Kevin, how about you? How are you doing? I'm okay. You know, I, I think like Courtney, there are good days and there are bad days. I mean, I actually was sort of self-isolating even before this, because I was writing this book, you know, that I just published, Sex and Vanity. So I 
starting in October, I was, you know, just really writing nonstop. And I finished the book in February and I was so excited to like, just, you know, be out there. I was going to start traveling again. I was going to go to Japan and Hong Kong and then, you know, start touring for the book. And then immediately, <laughs> I think it was a week after I had my freedom when everything started locking up again. So, you know, I went back inside and um, actually it's been, it's been interesting because I got busy, um, you know, writing a TV show. So I've been sort of huddled writing, but it's, you know, there's some days you just don't even want to do anything creative. You don't want to even get out of bed. You just want to just eat a lot of pasta. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Heather, we're, we are, I feel like we're on the exact same um, timeline because our books came out on the same day and we've finished writing these books at the exact same time too. So I was the same way. I had this wonderful spring planned where I was like, I'm, it's not going to be crazy busy. I'm going to read so many books and I'm going to be thinking about a new novel, but I won't have to be really writing it yet. And it's just going to be this like wonderful time when I'm going to do all these fabulous things with my life. And then it was like, actually, no, you're not doing any of those things. So I guess we've all experienced that in many different ways. Exactly. You know, just don't try to make any plans because you'll get jinxed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you both released a new novel on Tuesday, which was just yesterday. So congratulations and happy book birthday. And even though you're not touring, we do get to talk about it. So very excited to do so. I'm, I think my, one of my favorite things to ask an author on the birth of their new book is just the origin story. I'd love to hear like what question or nugget of an idea did you start with for Friends and Strangers, Courtney, and for Sex and Vanity, Kevin? Maybe Courtney, we'll start with you. Okay, so, um, you know, I think that uh, writers, I'm sure there are writers listening to this and, and they'll understand what I'm talking about. I think a lot of times an idea comes to you and it kind of has like the shimmer around it where you know it's something you're going to write about. But you might not write about it right then and there. That might not be the perfect moment to tell that story. So for me, about seven years ago, um, I was at Smith College where I went to college. I was giving a reading there and I came out of the reading. I was standing at a crosswalk waiting for the light to change. And this SUV pulled up and driving the SUV was a woman who uh, my senior year, I had babysat her newborn um, three days a week. And we became very close. Uh, she had just moved from New York City to Western Mass. She didn't really have friends in the area. I was a college senior and feeling like I'd really kind of outgrown college and wanted to be an adult. And so we sort of had this kind of unlikely friendship. And I would say, she really put me on my path to moving to New York, which I was very afraid to do, and, and becoming a writer, uh, which I very much wanted to do. And so she played a really valuable role in my life, and we were very intensely close for a period of time, but we grew apart, you know, as you do, like that relationship ended when I stopped watching her child. So 10 years later, I'm at Smith. She pulls up to the crosswalk. I see her. I'm like, oh my gosh, hi, it's me, it's me. She has no idea who I am because, you know, she's had 10 years worth of babysitters by now. So I went back to New York that night and I was having dinner with Jamie Attenberg, a fellow novelist. And I told Jamie this story and she's like, you should write a novel about that. I love this scene of the two women at the crosswalk. And I, I, it had the shimmer. I knew like, yeah, I wanted to write about that, but I'm not sure exactly what I would say yet. So I wrote another book, Saints for All Occasions. Now, many years went by, and um, when I was pregnant with my son, my first child, I found myself thinking of that idea again. Um, I think because at that point, I had been the babysitter, you know, I'd, I'd lived that role, and I knew I was about to enter into this other role of the mother, and um, I thought there was a lot to that that I wanted to explore, so I started writing it um, when I was pregnant and then, uh, you know, finished it just this spring. So by the time I was done with it, I had two small children. Wow. That's incredible. For anyone who has read the book, I know you haven't had that much time to read it yet, but you should definitely read it. But there's so much that 
is really directly reflected. And I, I love to hear about that. I love to hear about writers putting themselves into their stories. Kevin, tell us a little bit about the origin of Sex and Vanity. So I feel like Courtney and I are having these sort of parallel lives <laughs> in a strange way. Because, you know, I, the, the idea for Sex and Vanity really began about 10 years ago. I, you know, eight, or, eight to 10 years ago. Time is sort of blurred and collapsed for me quite a bit. But I, you know, started thinking about this idea when I was visiting Capri. Um, I would go to this beautiful island and, you know, every summer all these people converge on it from all around the world. And if you stay there more than, you know, one or two days, you start to see the same people circulating, you know, day after day. You see, it's such a small town. And I would just observe these families and particularly the teenagers in the families. And it also coincided at a time where, uh, you know, some really good friends of mine were sort of raising teenagers and having, you know, all the growing pains of, of having these hormonal kids around. And I would, you know, I would hear those stories and then I would be in Capri and I would see it up close and personal. You know, the, the first day this family arrives and there's usually like a surly, 16 year old daughter mm -hmm. doesn't want to be on vacation for parents and then by like day two you see that she's met up with the other local teenagers mm. and then by day three you see her she's holding hands with someone you know some like italian <laughs> boy or something like that and then by day five she's leaving the island and she's sobbing because she's you know <laughs> you know she's leaving her love her summer love so it's i i would see this time and time again every time i, I went back to capri and i thought this is just the perfect sort of stage to really sort of recreate um, an homage to a room of a view. So that's really kind of how it, how it began and, and it was sort of like, you know, really kind of taking shape over a number of years until I decided to write it this fall. Yes, tell us a little more about your connection with a room with a view and how you sort of built a tribute to it. Well, I read it for the first time, I think when I was a teenager as well, I was, I was 15 years old and the movie had just come out and I think it was kind of all the rage for a little moment, you know? And, and so I, you know, read the book and just absolutely was captivated by what E.M. Forster was doing. Cause I felt like he was so ahead of his time in the way that he was looking at a woman like Lucy Honeychurch, this character, you know, who is sort of kind of coming of age and, and sort of trapped between two worlds. She's a girl of the modern Edwardian age. It was 1908 but she's still very much pulled by these Victorian morals and you know, the structure of Victorian life. And just the way he, he sort of showed her evolution, but also the way he satirized you know, the, sort of the English upper classes was so fresh to me and, and so different. And I think I really sort of hooked into that. And then seeing the movie, of course, you, know, you fall in love with the whole movie, you fall in love with Italy. And it's really what sort of really propelled me to want to go to Italy. And so I pestered my parents and finally a couple of years later, we. We all went on a family trip to Italy, and that's when I first discovered Capri. So I feel like I'm coming to sort of full circle. Oh yeah, it's totally back. full circle. Yeah. Back to writing about the island now. I love yeah. that. Reading Sex and Vanity, I definitely left it feeling like I need to go pick up a room with a view again. I kind of want to read them side by side and see where you diverged and where you really stayed with the story. Yeah, I mean, I, it really was meant to be an homage but it really actually ended up, ended up being more of a departure point, you know? Yeah. Um, there's that original structure where, you know, they swap rooms and that's sort of like the meet cute. I don't think I'm getting too much away. But then I think my story just really diverged at that point. And it really became this, you know, this, this observation of, of a girl, of a biracial girl and her, and her search for her identity. I really love the character of Lucy Tang Churchill. You and I had a great conversation for time about this, and I'm just gonna- It was all about you. It was all about you, so. It turns out you wrote this book about me, and I'm so <laughs> flattered. So, Courtney and everyone, my name is Lucy, the character's name is Lucy. Uh, my, you know, my middle name is my Asian name, my Japanese name, Nakata. Mm -hmm. just like Tang is for Lucy. And we both went to the same college. We frequent the same spots in the West Village. Oh, wow. Shout out to Three Lives & Co. Bookstore and our friend Toby, who owns that bookstore that we miss dearly right now. And she's Hoppa. And that 
is something that I've never had the pleasure of reading about. So Kevin, I would love if you could talk just a little more about what drew you to writing a story about a Hoppe character and how you related to her? Well, I really felt that that was also, there was a gap in, in the marketplace in that I really, there are so few stories, you know, centered on, on Hoppe protagonists and, and heroines especially. And I have so many dear people in my life from friends and lots of relatives and cousins who, who are Hoppe, who are biracial you know, from, you know, they're Australian Chinese or American Chinese or British Chinese. It really, really runs the gamut. And I would see it's, it's such an interesting place to be in a way. And I think as a child, I looked at it in a position of envy almost, you know, because in Singapore, where I had these Kaba cousins, they were almost like these beautiful godlike creatures. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like they were instantly more glamorous than, than just little, little nerdy me. Um, and it's, but it's interesting, it's really context and where you are in the world, you know? So in, in Singapore, a colonial island where the British were rulers, to be half Chinese, half British, um, meant that you were a little bit more special. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a friend, for example, who, who was from that world and then moved to the US. And mm -hmm. suddenly from this position of feeling privileged was just marked as the Asian kid and subjected to horrible, you know, racist bullying in the US. Mm. So it's, it's interesting to see really where you are and how you were raised that it creates so many, it's such a spectrum of experiences, you know, dependent really on every individual. And I, I really felt like it was interesting to sort of want to explore that and really sh show that character, you know, of, of a girl that's really trying to, you know, find her place in the world, you know, in a world that is increasingly more complex and yet much more blended. Well, I, I just love and appreciate that so, so much. Um, I'm gonna give it to all my Hoppe friends. <laughs> we'll have you. a book club. <laughs> my cousins, see what yeah. they think. It's, it's really, um, it's a really cool thing to see. So we're kind of talking about race. Let's, let's dive a little further into race, which I think is on everyone's minds right now. We're going through a national reckoning with systemic racism and something in the publishing industry that came up recently was this social media campaign, hashtag publishing paid me. For those who don't know, that was a campaign that was basically asking uh, authors to share the advances that they got for their books and specifically trying to call out the pay inequities between white authors and authors of color, specifically black authors. And some of the numbers were just staggering. I mean, I really encourage everyone to go look that up um, on Twitter and, and just do a little research for yourselves. But I'm curious, Courtney and Kevin, if you followed that campaign if you were surprised by what you saw, if you did, and you know what what changes do you want to see in the publishing industry, Courtney? Maybe let's start with you. Um, well, I did follow it, and I I was actually quite surprised. You know, I think um, it's it's something that uh, if we were to really like look at these numbers, um, we would need we would need like full transparency of the whole. Uh, industry, I think, to really have an extremely clear picture. But from what we did see on Twitter, I was quite surprised. And certain writers in particular, um, who are just incredibly talented, incredibly accomplished, um, it was pretty shocking. Uh, I think that something, you know, that's very clear in publishing. Um, when I first moved to New York, I worked in magazine publishing, but it's very similar to book publishing in the sense that uh, you know, that to get your foot in the door, to get a job, um, you have to be able to live on very little money in the publishing world. And so um, I think what happens maybe a lot of the time is that, uh, you know, editors are, are maybe gravitating sometimes toward books uh, by people who remind them of themselves or people they know or whatever it might be. Um, I think there's like a lot of unconscious bias that comes into play. And certainly, you know, we need diverse stories more than ever. I, we, we've always needed them. Um, but to me, you know, 
the, the central sort of thing of this moment where Donald Trump is our president and he proudly proclaimed at the beginning of his presidency that he does not read. That told mm -hmm. me everything I needed to know and already feared and suspected. You know, reading is like our gateway to understanding people who are not like us. And, you know, understanding, I think, leads to empathy, leads to familiarity with people maybe we don't encounter every day in our lives. So I think it's so important um, to be really conscious of putting stories out there that reflect who we are, who, who actually lives in this country and in this world. I think that's that's beautifully said, and I can't agree more about the power of fiction in particular to inspire empathy and really allow you to sort of experience other people's perspectives. Yes, yeah. Kevin, what's on your mind when it comes to these things right now? I know you, you work very, very hard in publishing and in Hollywood to champion representation. Yeah, and it's, it's, for me, it was not surprising, but still shocking when you're actually seeing the numbers in front of you, you know? I mean, the slogan everyone knows in the industry is that publishing doesn't pay. You know, whether you're working behind the scenes in publishing for a magazine or a publisher, or whether you're publishing a book, you know, you can't usually expect to actually make a living doing it. But when you're actually confronted with the numbers, you know, and, and see, you know, when I would see what Roxanne Gay, for example, who is a friend of mine, who is one of the most remarkable writers, you know, in the world today, to see what she was paid for from some of her early books, it was startling. And then you see someone that has just, you know, their claim to fame is getting fired by Trump, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and they write a tell-all book and they get $3 million. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, are you even kidding me? Um, yeah. So that was, it really, really made me angry to see all these political tell-alls that are coming out, all from former White House employees that were fired by Trump. And they're making millions. Um, probably, you know, having books ghostwritten. I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> it, you know, it's, there has to be change and there has to be systemic change, you know, both in the publishing side, but but really also in Hollywood. And I think it's it, it really speaks to who is in power, who are in positions of power. And very seldom do you see, you know, people from diverse backgrounds in those power positions. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that has to change. Yes. You know, this brings to mind the topic of class, which goes hand in hand with race and is really central to both of your novels. I'd love to talk about how you approach themes of class and disparity in your writing and why that's important for you. Courtney, do you want to <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, you know, to me, um, class, I, I think novelists sort of tend to return to certain obsessions in their work, whether, you know, from one book to the next, whether the story is very different from the last book or not. For me, uh, class is one of my obsessions. I, I write about it, I think, in all of my books in different ways. Um, I think in the most recent book, Friends and Strangers, you know, as in the world, um, people of different social classes uh, are constantly, you know, coming together. These aren't like sort of these isolated bubbles here, there, and everywhere. They're, they're they're, we're all mixed together every single day. And in this, the world of this book in particular, it's work that brings people together. So you have Sam, this middle-class college student who really feels like a fish out of water at her fancy college because she's paying her own way. She's going to graduate with student loan debt. Um, and her friends are so much wealthier and they've traveled the world and they've done all these things that she hasn't. She herself feels much more aligned with the uh, Salvadoran women who work in the dining hall on campus, uh, who she has worked alongside as a student worker. Um, in her mind, she is much more like them than she is like her friends. Now, that's not how those women view her though. They, they do not see her as one of them. Um, and Elizabeth, uh, the woman whose child Sam cares for is from, a very wealthy family, but doesn't accept her family's money and therefore feels as though she is self-made. You know, I think we kind of, there's this interesting um, sort of 
thing that happens between you know being extremely successful and that being the american dream to some extent you know to to acquire and accumulate great wealth but also this need for it to have been something you did yourself that is reflective on your own greatness so you know i'm very interested in this book and looking at kind of the, the systems at play uh that sort of keep people where they are and yet that responsibility that's sort of pushed onto the individual to say well if you're not doing well if you're not succeeding if you couldn't keep your small business going it must be because of you um i'm always sort of amused watching politicians in a debate how they all start off saying they go back to whichever uh you know relative they had who didn't have money they're like my great great grandfather worked in a factory doing yada yada and it mm -hmm. makes me almost want to say like the first one of you who just gets up and says you know my dad worked for a hedge fund i had five homes i broke you know i'll vote for you because at least you're being honest you know so all of that i think turns up in this book yeah yeah it's definitely layered and i do love the point that you make in the book about Sam's relationship with the women who work in the dining halls and how she sees herself as more related to them. But really, race comes into play and it's just, it's a blind spot. And I think we're all really like reflecting on our blind spots and trying to identify and work on those. Yeah, and certainly, you know, privilege is a word that has come up a lot in recent years. And it's it's something that I was thinking about a lot when I was writing this book, um, different forms of privilege, you know, because Elizabeth is someone, you know, classically privileged with a trust fund and her dad gave her the down payment for her first home and that's allowed her to keep going and, you know, get better and better places over the years while still feeling as though she's doing it herself, even though she's not. Um, but Sam is very privileged too because she, you know, despite her student loan debt, she has this great education. Um, I think this idea of a safety net was very much on my mind when I was writing this book and thinking about, you know, there are women like Sam who feel they don't have this great safety net beneath them. But in fact, of course she does, you know, she has she's never gonna spend a night in a homeless shelter. You know, she's going to always have family and friends she can count on, even if it's not to buy her a house. You know, she can go sleep on her parents' couch. Um, I met a lot of people in the process of writing this book because I was working with uh, families who've been separated at the border and trying to reunite them and sort of help get them on their feet through a group called Immigrant Families Together. And in working with these moms who were separated from their children, it was something, you know, really eye-opening to me to see like not only do they have no safety net they actually are the safety net for their families back home in guatemala or el salvador mm -hmm. um, the second they cross that border even though to our american eyes they have nothing and it's true they have nothing uh, they're immediately expected to be sending money home because the people at home need it maybe even more than they do so you know this idea of sam aligning herself with the kitchen staff when in fact she really has no idea of the struggles that they are going through, even though they are together every day in that kitchen. Yes, yes. That, I mean, talk about perspective and talk about privilege. Kevin, I mean, the world of crazy rich Asians and now sex and vanity, like this, you can't really get any more privileged than the people that we're talking about here when it comes to their financial situation. Tell us a little bit about why why those issues are like the meat of your storytelling and also why satire. Yeah, I think, you know, like Courtney, I've always been interested in social structures. I mean, even from a very young age, I was always observing, you know, all these different sort of worlds colliding, uh, these different worlds of privilege, really. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up in Singapore, I would see the clash between old money and new money and moving to New York, I would see the exact same thing. And so this <laughs> book really very much is that investigation of that. And, you know, we've put these characters who are all privileged, but they're different degrees of privilege. And they all have different perceptions of how privileged they are, you know, which I think makes it interesting and which speaks to, you know, what they're all going through in their own struggles. You know, 
Lucy, for example, you know, she is a girl that was born on Park Avenue, literally, you know, she is a Park Avenue princess. And yet, because she's biracial, because she presents more Chinese, um, she's always felt like an outsider within her very, very waspy family, you know, a, a very, you know, high wasp, you know, blonde, blue eyed, British Scandinavian types, you know, she, there's a scene where she talks about how, you know, she has a cousin who is the, is sort of the beloved cousin, the one that the grandmother thinks is beautiful, um, for example, because she looks like Charlotte Grampling, you know, whereas she feels like the ugly duckling. And within her own same family, she's got a brother, you know, that presents more preppy, that looks slightly more Caucasian, and she feels like he's more privileged in that world, just by the way he looks, but also because he's a boy. And the boys in that family inherit much more than the girls. Um, so there's all these nuances at play here. And then of course she's engaged. I mean, I'm trying to say this without giving too many spoilers away, but she, you know, she's involved with a guy who is from very, very new money, very, very new, you know, sort of tech and oil money. And you see his issues, you know, growing up where he did um, and the complexes he has from being, you know, part of that world of new money, now trying to make it in New York and rolling the set of very old money elites. So I don't know, it's, it's always been sort of that, I've always been fascinated by, by all these different levels of snobbery. Um, <laughs> and to me, it's like, what is the point, really? You know what I mean? <laughs> especially, especially now when you think about it, you know, just... Just like really looking to fill time by creating hierarchies and feeling important. In a way, yes, but in a way it's, it's, it goes back to sort of tribal nature, you know, and going back to the cavemen. And these are people with their exclusive caves, you know, on top of the mountain maybe. And they wanna, they wanna keep the ones that they feel will be the most protected and be the most like them, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always differences that separate people, these, these as invisible as they might be you know, these little nuanced differences that people use to separate themselves. That to me is just human nature and kind of endlessly fascinating. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Lucy's engagement. I'd love to talk about the relationships at the center of both of your novels. Something that I noticed that they have in common is that you grapple with these characters who are in relationships and maybe even a little more concerned about how those relationships will inform their status in the eyes of other people than what they mean for them personally. Tell me a little bit about those, those observations and where that kind of interest comes from. Uh, well, you know, for me, I think, do you mean, you mean like romantic relationships in the book, yes. right? I mean, okay, so yeah. I think that um, for me, especially marriage is, is an endlessly fascinating thing to write about because I come to fiction writing um, as just a terrible snoop. Um, I started as a child, you know, writing stories about my extended family and at big family dinners, going under the table and taking notes on what people were saying. Um, very much inspired by Harriet the Spy, uh, very much emboldened by Harriet the Spy. And so, um, you know, marriage is to me endlessly fascinating because, uh, Oftentimes, you know, if a marriage ends uh, or you hear someone's having trouble, it's really surprising. And you think like, but I thought everything was going great there. Um, and I think it's sort of the ultimate relationship that happens truly behind closed doors that we don't really, no one really understands anyone else's marriage. Um, so I love writing about marriages for that reason. Um, I, you know, this is a very literary reference, but uh, when I was pregnant with my son, I was watching a lot of Shark Tank. Shark Tank was my, uh, my, every night I was sort of nauseous. I wasn't going out anymore. And I was just, my husband and I would just sit on the couch and watch Shark Tank. And a theme that emerges again and again on Shark Tank is, uh, and it's a very gendered thing. It seems to always be a man who has an invention and his wife has given up 
everything. Like they've been living for three years in his parents' basement in the suburbs of Atlanta or something. And they're, you know, uh, they've both put their life savings into this invention. And you're watching it on Shark Tank and you're like, God, that sounds actually sort of stupid. But I've always been amazed by these women and their faith. Um, they just believe in their men, you know, so much. And I think that we have this story in our culture, right, of like the great man who, you know, went out and tinkered in the garage and invented the computer or whatever. But what about the like not great man who is on Shark Tank and is, is rejected by everyone, you know? Um, how does that work within the context of a marriage? Uh, I wanted to write inside the head of one of those Shark Tank wives, basically. And that's why Elizabeth's husband is an inventor because I just wanted to know, you know, do they really believe or are they having to force themselves to believe? Um, so it's a great, kind of great little spoiler tidbit. Everybody has to read the book to find out if Elizabeth really believes in her husband's invention, which has to do with solar power. And we'll just tease it that way. <laughs> there you go. Yes. You know, it's um, my, my son watches this cartoon called Fireman Sam, like as many times a day as we will allow him to. And the, the in invention in my book is a solar powered grill. I think we can say that. And I was watching Fireman Sam with my son, Leo, after I had handed in the book. And there's a whole episode about this guy inventing a solar powered grill. Um, and I was like, I swear I didn't steal that from Fireman Sam, but that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Kevin, uh, so the question was about relationships that are sort of performative and for other people more than they are for the people in them, which is definitely a theme or a sort of question that comes up in Sex and Vanity. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny. Courtney was watching Shark Tank. I've been watching a lot of Below Deck. Mm. Thing on Below Deck, which, you know, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's really a reality show that looks at the life of a charter um, mega yacht, basically. And it's the, the crew of a mega yacht. And every week they've got a different, you know, family or different charter guest that will spend, what, one hundred fifty to $200,000 chartering the yacht for the week or for a few days. And it's so interesting to me in that the people chartering the yacht, the rich people, of course, they're mainly miserable. And they're sort of preening and getting dressed up every night and putting on clothes to have these meals on board the, on board the yacht. And there is this art artificiality to them. I mean, it's very seldom that you actually see them actually truly having fun. Now, who's having fun? It's the people below deck. It's the people working who are stressed out, who are cooking and cleaning and like serving these masters for the week. Um, and that's, I think, a very apt metaphor for what goes on in my book because you have, you know, Lucy, who is in such a position of privilege, but she's not really living for herself. You know, she's living for appearance's sake. And she's choosing to, you know, make life decisions about who to marry, who to love, based on what she thinks will gain her acceptance with her family and with her social group. And I think that is something you really do see a lot in, in sort of the upper classes, you know, where it's, it's very much about keeping up with the Joneses on a very, very high level. And there's a lot of misery involved because they're all trying to do the same things and they have the same signifiers and, and none of, you know, very few of them are living lives that are really authentic and original um, as some of the other characters in my book are. Let's not give it away. So, you know, Lucy has to reckon with that and, and sort of decide for herself, like what really she wants, you know, in her life. Yeah, living for other people, very high on the what not to do list. <laughs> if you walk away with a nugget of wisdom from tonight, let, let it be that or let that be one of them. I have some questions from uh, viewers that I will share. Uh, here's one. Kevin and Courtney, what surprised you about your latest books? unexpected directions in the writing process, the story, et cetera. So what surprises did you run into along the way? Hmm. Uh, I, I think for me, um, well, I think, you know, a book always sort of uh, looks one way in your mind to begin with and you, um, 
you're always surprised by certain things. So for me, you know, when I was writing this book, um, I think a lot of people who've, who've read it, they sort of immediately think I identify with Elizabeth, who's this Brooklyn mother with a baby, which yes, I am also that person, but I much more identify personally and in my background with Sam, the babysitter. Mm -hmm. And so when I started writing the book, um, uh, I was writing Elizabeth, you know, really pretty much present day. The book takes place in 2015, but um, I was writing her life as a new mother very much as I was experiencing my own life as a new mother. Um, and much of it in the story revolves around sort of like this Facebook group that her uh, that's based in her neighborhood in Brooklyn and the idea of women kind of connecting in these online spaces now, um, especially new mothers. And so I wanted to keep that in the book, but I was also writing Sam at the same time as this 21 year old, um, you know, and basically I knew in the back of my head that a problem existed, which was I was writing Sam as a 21 year old, basically when I was 21 which is, you know, 2002, um, and then writing Elizabeth now. And, and so when the book was done, it seemed like Sam lived in another world from Elizabeth, and I had to kind of redo her and get into the headspace of um, a young, very young woman now, you know, like, what is she actually doing? So there were things, um, I had written a whole chapter, many chapters of Sam um, living abroad for a year, uh, which is what I did. And, and I was a nanny for a family with three boys under the age of two in London for a year. But it just kind of didn't work. And so I kind of had to just update Sam. And so I think she ended up being sort of the big surprise to me of the book. And also kind of the role that the women she works with in the kitchen took on that they ended up being um, a really important part of the story to me. And, and you know, speaking of talking about diversity in publishing, I really worked very hard to make sure that they had what felt like an authentic voice um, because they are not, their lived experience is very different from my own. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Kevin, surprises in, in your process? So everything about this book surprised me. Um, Courtney and I have the same editor, the amazing Jenny Jackson, and yes. she's kind of a, I don't know, she's like this magician in the way that she convinces you to do things that you maybe don't want to do. Um, you know, in, in the case of this book, you know, I really had four months to write it. I was on such a tight schedule. And she's like, just write a little, little novella. Like, it could be like 200 pages long, you know, and, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I felt like Room of the View which is like 190 pages would be this perfect homage. And I ended up writing a book that was, you know, I think it's it's over 400 pages at this point. And it just took off in a whole different direction than I expected it would. You know, it started out with a remove you as a departure point. But then, I don't know if this happens to you, Courtney, but the characters really start speaking to you, or at least they do to me. And they yeah. start dictating where they want to go, what they want to say. And yeah. you're sort of not in control anymore, you know? Absolutely. so. Yeah, so I, I felt like with Lucy, it's, it's such a rich experience. I was able to really go into her character and, and channel all these things that I never thought I would, you know, and really go deep in a way that I hope is, is, is sort of meaningful and, and connective for readers. And then all these characters that, you know, are not in a room of you popped up and created themselves, you know, mm. from my novel that I never expected um, would exist. Um, so it just, it really took off in so many different directions. There's, you know, there's Mordecai, who's this amazing pretentious snob that just sort of invented himself and appeared one day on the dock in Capri and was like, no, you're going to write a chapter about me. <laughs> and so I did. And it, you know, turned out to be, I think, one of my favorite chapters in the whole book. You know, there's this amazing misadventure that happens in Positano. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm really shocked by what I was able to do in the four months that I had and really pleased with um, all the little stories and, and weird cracks we were able to go into with the book. It always sounds like some kind of sorcery to me when authors talk about how like characters just speak to them from the page. It's, it's amazing. It's such a cool gift that you have to be able to hear them when they talk to you. I know it sounds <laughs> crazy and I know we sound crazy, but it really is true. It just sort of happens. Yeah. 
I have another question here and actually just a quick shout out to the person who asked what it was like to work with Jenny. Someone did. So I'm glad that we touched on that. Oh. Um, oh, yeah, I really like this question. It's something on my mind too. Can you let us know what it's like to be selected for the GMA book club and read with Jenna Today Show book club? I'm so curious as this person is, what kind of impact that has on your publishing experience? Um, well, for me, so this is my fifth novel. And, um, you know, I'm really aware, um, like my first novel when it came out, I, um, I just didn't really understand, you know, how the publishing world worked at all. I, I worked at the New York Times. I was a research assistant there for two of the op-ed columnists. And so I knew people in, in media sort of, but I was, I was really unaware of kind of like the machine that is the publishing business. Um, and, uh, you know, some wonderful media things happened for me and I was just kind of delighted and, um, you know, came to understand more about the kind of like the work that goes in that publicists do, that marketing people do, that, that everyone does to, to get a book out there and to get it noticed. And I think in the 11 years I've been publishing, it really has gotten harder and harder in a lot of ways. Um, I just feel really lucky to have been picked by the, the Today Show Jenna, Read with Jenna book club for this because I think it is a way um, right now that books are getting into readers' hands. And I also really love her taste generally. I, I love all the books she picks. Um, Writers and Lovers, the most recent Lily King, I just, that blew me away. And Kevin Wilson's Nothing to See Here. So many of the books she picks, A Burning, just so many of them are books that I want to read anyway. So I was very honored to be picked um, on kind of the strategic business level and also on a personal level by her. Yeah, it is. you are an amazing company. The Kevin Wilson book and the Lily King book, both fantastic. Mm -hmm. Recommend so to everyone. Me too. Congratulations, Courtney. I didn't know the, the news. So I think that's amazing. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And to you as well. Yeah. And to you as well. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I think like square announcement for you, Kevin, that was crazy. It, it really was. And I like, you know, like Courtney, I just, I really feel so tremendously honored, number one, but also really lucky because I think we are in this whole new space where it's like, I never, ex you know, none of us expected that we would have books out in the middle of, you know, this lockdown and, 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 you know, it's, it's really changed the landscape for, for booksellers, you know, like the fact that bookstores, for the, by and large, have to remain closed and really do just a mail order business. Yeah. Um, it's tough on everyone. So, you know, anything and everything helps, I think, to get the awareness out, but also hopefully, you know, with Good Morning America and the Today Show, sort of, you know, sort of being advocates for these books, you know, we will sell more books and booksellers will sell more books. Yeah. You know, independent bookstores will thrive through this, hopefully, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, we'll see what happens, but it's, it's very, very exciting. And I'm looking forward to being on GMA and talking about my book and having, you know, I've never really done a huge book club like this before. So it'll be so fun to really hopefully interact with the audience in that way and, you know, see what happens. Yeah, I have to imagine that you must really be missing that part of the process since you both you know, are very familiar with the tours and with meeting readers, it's gotta be, one of the most fun parts of launching a book. I mean, writing is such an isolating profession. You know, you're, you're in a room, you're in a corner writing your heart out for a year or more usually. And so for me, I personally, I really, really love getting out there and especially going to small towns across America or in Europe and, and really just meeting people. Like who are these people that would actually like pay money and read something I've written? I wanna, <laughs> I wanna know them, I wanna thank them, I wanna meet them. And I want to answer their questions and, and, you know, really kind of be there. And it's, it's, it's interesting that in this day and age, we can't do it at the moment, but hopefully we, we will be able to, you know, sooner rather than later. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think reading a novel, it tends to, um, you know, kind of unlock something in the reader. Uh, so I feel like with each of my books, there's been some, 
aspect or sometimes different aspects of one novel that people feel personally connected to. So something really wonderful about going on book tour is hearing people's stories and hearing why that particular book spoke to them. And I agree with Kevin. It's, it's still to me astonishing that anyone, you know, there's so many books and there's so many things you can do with your time. It, it still astonishes me that people uh, read my books and would come to an event. Um, I remember when my first novel was published, a friend of mine who's a nonfiction writer, he told me that he had flown from New York to California to give a reading and there were two people who showed up. And he said at first he was really kind of mad. And then he thought to himself, there's like two people in Los Angeles who all the other things you could do in Los Angeles tonight, they decided to come see me at this bookstore. That's crazy, you know? And I still think about that now. It's really true. It's, it's such an amazing gift. Oh, yeah. That's, I like that a lot. And also I bet he had the best conversation with readers he's ever had with those exactly. two people. Exactly. Really exactly. His two super fans. I mean, I, I you know, have done events where uh, I remember doing an event for my first novel where I was like sitting uh, there in a store and then they also had like a table that had cheese on it. And I will say that the cheese table got a lot more action than my table did. <laughs> um, and I think the only person who talked to me the whole night was like, what kind of cheese do you recommend? You know, but um, I really like cheese. So that was fine. Like we got into that, you know, you never know where the night will lead you on book tour. Totally. I think, I bet Courtney and I have great war stories from like early oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I, yeah, I went to, I was invited to a, a book festival once, I won't say where, where it was, and it was very early on in my career, and so, you know, I, I went, I flew out to the city, and, you know, the, the book festival began, and it was me at a little table, a little card table with my books, and next to me was an amazing, highly, highly respected New York Times best-selling critical acclaim author, and it was the both of us. And then there was this table with these two bloggers. And there was a line wrapped around the auditorium to meet the bloggers. <laughs> you know, Ooh. and the two of us are just sitting here going, okay, we'll just chat with each other, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because oh, yeah. everyone's here to see these bloggers. It was just so bizarre. Who were the bloggers? I really shouldn't say. They were so lovely. But, you know, <laughs> they had an amazing fan base, you know, that came out and wanted their books signed. And we would have little dribbles of people that would come by, but it was so meaningful to be able to meet these people who actually came out on a Saturday to come come see us, you know, these two little writers from New York um, versus <laughs> like rock star bloggers next to us, you know, so. You know. Anonymous rock star bloggers. Yeah. They so were like home improvement people. They were like oh. this adorable home improvement, you know, DIY. A couple? Royalty. <laughs> was it Chip and Joanna? <laughs> it wasn't Chip and Joanna. No. Okay. Yeah. But. Okay. We have about sixty seconds left, and I and I love this last reader question. So we'll just do a rapid round. Yeah. What books are you both turning to during this time? Mm. Um. Well, I just read. Um. Just finished reading girl woman other which mm -hmm. absolutely blew me away i will confess that with very little children and very little time i am doing a lot of audio books right now um and i find that that's like such a gift to a parent uh, or anyone who doesn't have a lot of time to sit down and actually read a physical book because that's how i'm consuming a lot of books these days um uh, the real, the last sort of real book I actually held in my hands was probably Writers and Lovers, and I absolutely adored it. Um, another book called Want, which is coming out next week, um, fantastic novel. Like I stayed up all night reading it, knowing that I would hate myself in the morning, but I couldn't resist. Um, and and Girl, Woman, Other, just that book is tremendous. I recommend it to everyone. That's a really strong lineup. Really strong. <laughs> Evan, how about you? Well, I just started Courtney's book, and I'm absolutely loving it. So oh, thanks, Evan. <laughs> that's my book of the week. But Aww. before that, I wrote, I read um, just an amazing, astonishing book by a friend of mine who I know is a novelist, but she wrote a, a memoir. Uh, Lacey Crawford um, wrote a book called Notes on a Silencing. Yeah. And oh. There's a big New York Times story on it. I think 
this week or last week. Um, I don't want to give too much away, um, but it's her, her experiences going to a very exclusive prep school and, and what happened there. But it was hmm. just, it's, it blew me away. It's an, it's an amazing, important book that I, I really recommend. Um, it's, a, it's a very hard read. Um, yeah, there were, there really were nice read. Yeah, 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 there were nights I was reading it where I was just so, so, so angry. Um, mm. um, reading the reading the story uh, because of the injustice that happens, but it's it's I think it's, it's a book everyone should read. And then on a lighter note, um, I've sort of fallen in love with Christopher Ballin's books. Um, he wrote a novel this year that came out in the spring called A Beautiful Crime, and it's set in Venice. And it's kind of like a talented Mr. Ripley. There's a crime mm -hmm. caper. There's a con artist, um, but it's so beautifully written. I mean, his his you know, every sentence is poetry. And so I read his book, the most recent one, and then I went and read his last book, which is called The Destroyers. And that's set on an island in Greece. So they're all very summer friendly, but but really very, very yeah. sensitive books and beautifully written, so. Well, Those there are... you have it, everybody. A really diverse and exciting list of what to read next from Kevin and Courtney. Thank you so much, Kevin, Courtney, and Lucy. This has been such a wonderful conversation and congratulations on your new books. And thank you to everyone watching. You've been an absolutely delightful audience. Just as a reminder, you can find the full catalogs for both of these speakers here tonight and much more at the Books Are Magic website, booksaremagic.net. The event tonight is part of an ongoing series at Doubleday called Two Writers Talking, which pairs brilliant writers like Kevin and Jay Courtney with an equally enthusiastic moderator to bring lively discussions about everything from true crime to true love to your local computer. Be on the lookout for our next event later this month on Doubleday's social media channels or on our Eventbrite page. Thank you for joining and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.